Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus Van Staden of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. And a good afternoon in London, where we're going back to the Financial Times newsroom, where Tom Burgess, an investigations correspondent there, uh, joins us again on the show. And we're pleased to have him back to talk about his brand new book. Uh, it's a long name here, so bear with me. The Looting Machine, Warlords, Tycoons, Smugglers, and the Systematic Theft of Africa's Wealth. Uh, welcome back to the show, Tom. Hi, Eric. Very good to be back with you. Well, listen, the book came out earlier this year, and it really, as I was mentioning in, before we started the show, it's on my top five of all-time China-Africa books, so I, I can't recommend it enough. It threw me for a little bit of a surprise to find out how much attention you actually spent uh, focusing on the Chinese and their involvement in what you call the looting machine. So before we kind of get too far into the weeds on the Chinese kind of complicity in all of this... Why don't you start by just telling us, in broad terms, what is the looting machine? Uh, well, Eric, first of all, it's a tremendous honor to be on the Hollander Hall of Fame. Um, that's, uh, <laughs> Only that's, five that's books get there. Five. <laughs> it's, it's beyond, Howard it's beyond French. my wildest dreams. <laughs> that's right. Forget the New York Times. Forget the New Yorker. You're on our top five. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so so the, the looting machine, in, t in two sentences, is um, that for 20-odd years, economists have been looking at this idea of a resource curse that countries, um, uh, often in Africa, that are very, very rich in natural resources, resources get screwed over in all kinds of ways as a result of that natural wealth and this paradox of plenty whereby huge amounts of oil or ores or minerals or diamonds or whatever it may be often goes hand in hand with very bad governance with with deeper poverty than you'd find in equivalent countries without those resources uh, in, in conflict um in, in deep-seated corruption and in lots of other horrible things um and the reason the book's called the looting machine is to try to make the point that um this isn't just some sort of quirk of economics, some 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 phenomenon uh, without any human input. It, it's a, it's a systematic machine um, which has beneficiaries and which has systematic ways in which it plugs into the global economy for the benefit of uh, a few and a, at the expense of the many. That's what it is in a nutshell. And how does China fit into into the looting machine according to to how you lay it out in the book? Well. Um, in various subtle ways. Um, first of all, the thing to say is that the looting machine is kind of colorblind. Um, uh, and increasingly in, in the last, in the era of, or in this current era of globalization, it's become a machine where, where kind of national interests are often subverted to the interests of, of, of transnational networks that involve Africans, Chinese people, Western multinationals, all sorts of middlemen, often, often in the same networks. Um, it's not limited by, by country. Um, at China fits in in, in, a, in a couple of broad ways. One, in, one is in the way that you, that you discuss on this on the show all the time, the way that it has kind of recast the geopolitics of Africa and the way it's, um, it's kind of refired competition for an interest in African commodities especially, but all sorts of other elements of African international relations as well. Um, that, that, that's one sort of broad part of it I tried to get into. And the other is, um, especially through looking, uh, as I do quite a lot, um, as Eric was mentioning, at this guy called Sam Pa, uh, a kind of Chinese uh, businessman and middleman in, in Africa and in African resource deals. Th the extent to which the grand kind of state-to-state -state pacts that we've seen between um, China and Chinese state-owned companies and African governments have in the, in the background far more shadowy deals uh, and deals that aren't really part um, or at least primarily aren't really part of of kind of diplomatic relationships between nation states but um, are, are more like the old networks that we used to see with something like France Afrique, the old, the old French network in West Africa um, whereby uh, people with high level political connections cut deals with very corrupt rulers for, for, for the benefit of all, of all involved um, in often very secretive ways. Now you don't say this explicitly so I might be putting some, some words in your mouth here but it the, the premise of the book in many ways kind of said whoever was on top of the global economy or had the most power and presence in Africa typically had the, the greatest kind of hand in the African cookie jar, the looting machine, as you put it. So there was a period where the British 
in their colonial empire, and they kind of ruled it and extracted as much as they could and then warped the politics and the people. Then the French, obviously, and there was an overlap there. And the Chinese now are in some ways the, the, the kind of inheritors of that. And you don't really dif- distinguish between the Chinese, the French, the British, and all the previous kind of foreign powers and colonial powers who at one time or another ran the, the looting machine. You're just saying they are the, the latest, newest actor in all of this. And morally... Uh, you know, I guess on a moral level, there is no difference between them. They're not better. They're not worse. They are just following a well-trodden path. I think to some extent there's, um, there's a point to be made about how um, uh, the, 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 the commercial relationships worldwide have, have evolved over the last hundred years that isn't really necessarily strictly to do with China or France or anyone else. It's, um, if you go back to Cecil Rhodes um, uh, and his sort of... Um, conquest of southern africa in the name of of commerce and in the name of the british crown it was basically a way of of um of advancing personal commercial interests under the cover of of diplomacy or under the cover of kind of imperial expansion um and 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 the nation state was very much tied into that the the british okay occasionally felt that that rhodes was has kind of gone off the reservation and was um was acting without without approval but nonetheless he was he was ultimately backed by london um I think now uh, that, that that changes obviously through the Cold War, and then it changes dramatically again after the Cold War. And now you have a situation where um, there is still a structure in Africa that looks like the uh, in, in parts of Africa we shouldn't generalise, but in in the big resource states certainly um, a structure where you have uh, what what in a different way what you used to have under the old colonial regimes, which was a local elite um which harnesses the state to its own benefit and has a a kind of foreign partner to which its interests are aligned that used to be um imperial capitals that used to be um uh uh, paris or or brussels or or london um or beyond that it used to be uh, washington and moscow and and now i'd say that the foreign element of that the, the the overseas element of that has kind of as with many things over the last 20 years been kind of privatized and that the and that local elites where they capture resource wealth for their own benefit through through so kind of kleptocratic rule their foreign partner is not some colonial power as it used to be clearly and, and I, I and i don't think china is a colonial partner in the old sense but i think there are these um these kind of transnational networks i mean to some extent they're just commodity markets but they're also very large multinationals and and they're middlemen so i think it has it has evolved so that the comparison doesn't quite hold and i don't think you can say that china is behaving in africa exactly the, the same way that cecil rose behaved in africa that would be an exaggeration but a lot of people did make the comparison as i spoke to them between Rhodes and the and the queensway group this kind of half state half private mysterious vehicle that that that, that sam pa has has led into africa trading his chinese connections and trading his connections with uh mugabe's regime or dos santos in angola or or um or elsewhere with the, with a military junction in, um, in in Guinea, and I think the the reason they draw that connection is is simply because it's 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 as though we're dealing with things like the old Cecil Rhodes companies or or the East India Company. It, we're dealing with networks that fuse state power and com and commercial power in a, in a very kind of globalized way. If that makes um, any sense. So, at all. so if you um you, you know kind of you. you uh, most of your attention on the China Africa issue in your book goes to particularly this, the the Queensway group, um, and the, you know the case of the case of Sampa. How um, how far would you be comfortable to extend the example of the Queensway group to the rest of Chinese engagement in Africa? To which extent can you draw parallels to how how, for example, state owned or you know kind of enterprises work? Or to which extent is the Queensway Group, its own freakish case study. Yeah, but that's that's really interesting. The um, I think there are, there's an extent to which the Queensway Group is unique simply by timing, as much as anything that um, Sam and his his partners came together uh, around 2002, just as. Um, China was launching its first kind of forays into Africa. Those first engagements with Angola that that would then be followed elsewhere. Um, it, it, it's pretty unique in the way that it has um, it, it has a, 
a, an extraordinary set of connections to Chinese intelligence, to Chinese state-owned companies, to the Communist Party, um, and also to to African intelligence networks and and um, African kind of power brokers. I think there is there is quite an important difference to the extent that um, Chinese deals, while they are often opaque uh, in Africa, the big the big resources for infrastructure deals, they are they at least have some element of kind of parliamentary oversight in places like Tanzania um, and and even latterly in places like like Guinea there is there is more oversight these deals are more uh, it, it, it's cl- it's much clearer who the actors are um, that you're talking about you know in a, in a classic sense you'd have one of the big Chinese state-owned oil companies one of the big Chinese banks um, and, and an African government whereas with the Queensway group you're looking at this kind of web of offshore interests um, I, I think I think a point that that goes for both the Queensway Group deals and the bigger Chinese state, not necessarily bigger actually, but the separate Chinese state-to-state deals, is that it can sometimes be a mistake, I think, and this is the point I try to make in the book, to see these things as... um, uh, as in a sort of Manichaean way, as as East versus West, tussling within Africa. I mean, a, a... a good example is somewhere like Nigeria, where you have Sinux, one of the big oil companies from China, state-owned, in business with Total of France and very lucratively exploiting an enormous offshore oil field. In in Niger, people, when I was there, confidently predicting that the Chinese and Areva, the big French atomic energy company and uranium miner, would, um, would be cooperating in the years to come. In Guinea, you now have Rio Tinto and Chinalco, uh, prospecting together uh, the 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 world's biggest undeveloped iron ore deposit, and I, I think that and this is something I tried to do in the book. I think that so, sometimes you get you get an interesting angle on all of this by looking at it through the perspective of um, the global commodities markets rather than China versus the West in Africa or, or anywhere else, and looking at this as you know there are um, there are very very powerful and large. Um, commodity markets, resource markets that deliver to the industrialized, industrialized world the kind of basic ingredients of everyday economic life. Um, and the interests of those markets often seem to trump s- strategic interest or strategic rivalries that you might see between nation states. So those examples I've just gone through, and, and, and they come up in even more bizarre ways with the Queensway Group, which has uh, a, a stake in a, you know, it's in some ways um, a jingoistically Chinese operation, but in other ways it's got a partnership with BP in Angola. It's got a partnership in in Guinea with a with a with a British an Australian British um, uh, mining company. It's it's you know banks with Western banks. It has assets in Manhattan. Um, these um, both Queensway Group and and the and the broader Chinese state-owned companies, it seems to me, are are more kind of big, powerful players um, in in a market that serves itself r- r- first and foremost these days, rather than necessarily tools of their home capitals. Yeah, it's part of the the kind of globalized economy as opposed to a national economy as it was in the imperial days. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's that. That is a very succinct way of what I just spent five minutes trying to say. <laughs> Fair enough. The you know, as I was as I was reading the book, I, I had a theory of, that Cobus kind of puts out every once in a while, which is that the the Chinese kind of rise to the level in terms of their corporate governance of whatever country they're operating in. So, for example, in London and Washington and Tokyo, where there's a very strong rule of law, uh, Chinese companies don't have a reputation of behaving badly. Uh, yet, in throughout Africa, there is a, a myriad of Chinese behavior, from South Africa to Mali to the DRC. And I was, as you were kind of walking around and guiding us through the looting machine across Africa, I, I kept hearing kind of Kobus's theory there that there is a, a, a wide array and a wide variety of Chinese behavior uh, in, in corruption and, and doing malfeasance. And, and so, you know, when when you step back now after you wrote the book. Um, do you have this kind of view of the Chinese macro as being a kind of, again, looters and, and kind of feeding into this negative narrative? Or 
Is it more complex than that? I mean, I, I think I know what you're going to say, but really when you put the book down, you don't have a very good feeling about the Chinese presence in Africa, I mean, as a whole, because you went through half a dozen countries showing us exactly how the Chinese are undermining governance, rule of law, corruption, uh, kind of entrenching elite power. Um, and so it's very easy to walk away from your book thinking, oh, this isn't good. Well, yeah, it is. But I, but I think I hope you'd walk away from the book not thinking that that, that not applying that um, necessarily more to China than you would to, say, U.S. companies or European companies. I think my, the point I'm trying to get across is that there's um, the, the industry itself in all its hues, the oil industry, the mining industry and its local political partners – is complicit in this in this mass looting, and that that um, and that the Chinese approach um, differs in some to the extent that you can call it a Chinese one unified Chinese approach, which is difficult. But it it, it differs in some ways politically and in, in sort of business techniques from the old Western companies that have been there longer. But f ultimately, it's the industry as a whole that's kind of hardwired for corruption, and that feeds into these economic structures that cause such. Such distortions, if you see, if you see what I'm getting at. Mm, yeah. Um, but the, uh, but a bit, but on the um, so, so but on the other side, I think have I, have I understood this right? That you're getting at the the idea that the Chinese Corbis's idea that the Chinese will kind of um, adapt, will play, adapt and play by whatever they see to to be the local rules. That is right. Cobus, I mean, I'm taking words out of your mouth. You, this is your theory here. You've kind of said that, you know, wherever there is a stronger rule of law, the Chinese generally adhere to that. And whether there's weaker or vacuums, uh, they, they, they'll take advantage of that. Am I, is that a correct assessment of your theory, Cobus? Yes, that's that's generally what I you know kind of what I think you know kind of I, I originally thought about this or thought you know kind of thought this up mostly in relation to environmental governance you know kind of where there's where there's more environmental governance where there's more you know um, implementation uh, you know better law and better implementation of that law then generally you know kind of Chinese especially larger Chinese actors tend to play ball um, you know kind of where there's a, a vacuum or corruption or very weak Im implementation then you see situation like you have in Mozambique, for example, or in Congo, Brazzaville, where, you know, kind of local, for example, logging um, permit systems end up being really exploited, you know, kind of by Chinese actors frequently enabled by local, local, you know, kind of middle middlemen. Um, so, you know, kind of the, we, we've seen that a lot in, in environmental issues. And I think it's, it's probably true in lots of other, you know, kind of cases as well. But, but Kobus, if I can ask you something, the, the, what, does that is that a specifically Chinese thing? I mean, couldn't you say that about um, you know Singaporean companies or, or Belgian ones? Well, no, you can, couldn't necessarily say that about, say, for example, American companies, which have a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Though it's not enforced very much, it at least sits out there to try and insulate uh, you know other countries from American malfeasance, regardless of the the governance of a country, presumably. Yeah, yeah, you know, kind of, and also I think, you know, at, at this moment in history, particularly, there are a lot of Chinese actors, you know, kind of around looking for opportunities in Africa, whereas there aren't as many from, you know, kind of from other, from from Singapore, for example, um, you know, kind of, but but I think the same mechanisms could very easily apply to other places as well. Tom, what do you think, and I'm, I'm assuming you haven't gotten any official response from the Chinese foreign ministry, but if you had a chance to sit down with Wang Yi, uh, the Chinese foreign minister. <laughs> yeah. And he read I'd your love, book. I'd love to. Wouldn't yeah. that be great? You know, a little dinner with Wang yeah. Yi, you know, and, you know, have a little chit chat. Um, you know, your book very much undermines the kind of headline of the Chinese win-win propaganda and that the Chinese are not behaving like the colonial powers. They are, this is South-South cooperation. We're here for mutual benefit. Um, your book really undermines that in many, many ways um, to show that the relationship is far more complex than the Chinese propaganda construes it to be. What do you think someone like Wang Yi or, um, you know, any of the Chinese foreign ministry, the official kind of spokespeople would say to your book in response? Well, I mean, I had a chance to run a bit of it past one of the Chinese diplomats. I mean, when I, when I met with Xie Huang, the, who was at the time the ambassador in Niamey, which was obviously a, you know, a, big, um, a big spot, Niger was a big spot at the time, still is for Chinese investment in refineries and, and infrastructure and oil and uranium. Um, and, uh, I mean, he, he put the classic Chinese line, and he put it very eloquently, 
which is um, which is to say, well, you know, the, the French have been here a long time, but it appears that government revenue from uranium is about the same as government revenue from onions. So you could understand why the Nigerian government might be looking for a different partner. And here we are. And, we're, and he was very careful, Zhao yeah, was very careful to um, not to slip into an outright comparison with the French or anyone else. But but he was basically saying, look, we're, we offer a more profit, profitable version. We offer infrastructure alongside exploitation if you like um <laughs> and i think i don't know i think that i i, I think um I, I do try to 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 interrogate the oversimplistic chinese kind of propaganda line on this but there is there remains something in it and i think i would probably agree sitting down with with a senior chinese official that that it, it, it is very attractive in many ways it's the old thing we always talk about but the the offer of um the offer of massive infrastructure is um, is enormously uh, attractive, both to a sort of kleptocrat who wants to be absolved of having to take any money out of his own pocket to pay for this stuff, and to you know well-meaning um, ministers or, or rulers in, in African countries. But the, the 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 problem is not necessarily one of of good faith. I don't think. Uh, I think there. Is, I, I think. I think the, in, the, in the Chinese officials I've encountered, I think there is a genuine belief. Um, that this could be a sort of win-win proposition, horrible business jargon term though that is. Um, b- but I, I quite, I was quite interested in the argument that even if you assume you give everyone the benefit of the doubt and you assume that all oh, every sort of road and railway is being built under a you know um, a contract under reasonable terms and 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 being built with um, with the best intentions in mind of of spurring broader economic activity, I think that. Fundamentally, the big Chinese engagement with Africa it, it, it perpetuates the trap, the kind of resource trap, by pushing up prices. Okay, they've been falling recently, but they'd be a lot lower than they were at the moment, was it not for Chinese demand? Um, and there have been lots of Chinese direct investments in, in, in oil and mining. And how can you, it doesn't matter how many roads you build, if you perpetuate in countries like Nigeria or Angola or, or, or the DRC and increasingly East Africa, if you perpetuate an economic model that keeps these African countries basically as the lowest rungs on the global supply chain, economically speaking, churning out raw materials, you can build an awful lot of roads, but the distortions in the economy that come from being resource dependent will override I, th- I, I would think, and I know this is not a generalization, but by and large, I, you'd think would over those distortions would override any help towards industrialization that all that infrastructure might bring. Um, you know, kind of, I was wondering what you would say to a proponent of the Africa Rising narrative. Um, you know, kind of your your book, also the, it's a, a reviewer, uh, Michael I were wrong, I think, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, um, in New York Times made that point that you, you seem to be taking quite a kind of a stark uh, you know, position against the, the Africa rising narrative, and she was also complaining that you don't um, that you don't g- you know kind of give any kind of suggestions of what should be done to change the system. I was wondering, like, how you see this Africa rising narrative in this context, and whether there's anything that China can do to actually, you know, kind of change the system and and, and kind of move Africa up those rungs. Well, I I mean, I probably fall into this trap myself, but I always thought that the, the first part of the Africa, the first problem with Africa rising was the first word, and the, which is which is obviously an enormous generalization. I've, and I've tried as best as I could, although this is a book that obviously leaps around all over the continent, n- not to generalize except when there are kind of really obvious evidential trends that you can see. Um, so the idea that an entire continent, be it Africa or anywhere else, is universally on the up, is, it, it just seems to be complete nonsense. And um, and I always had and still have a, a suspicion that the Africa rising narrative was driven in some measure, possibly quite a large measure, by a lot of investment bankers who couldn't find any, any, any um, risky and potentially high yielding assets anywhere else because of the financial crisis and wanted to find them in Africa. Um, and you know, to pick to pick the facts to fit the to, to fit the narrative they they wanted. There obviously are huge advances, and 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 in specific places. I mean, someone like Lagos is obviously booming, and it is, um, and it, it's better in all manner of ways that, for, for, from how it was 15 years ago. But it's still a big and screwed up city um, if you happen to be um, living in one of the slums there. Similarly, somewhere like Angola, I mean, you can see what you want. You you turn up, you you stand on the 
uh, on the coast road there and you know you look up and you see the enormous new glistening um the hotel with its 40 dollar cheese sandwiches and you might think oh okay great this is a boom and then you turn 45 degrees to your right and there's you know a slum that's being slammed by the atlantic ocean and which doesn't have any services um I, so I, I think that the africa rising narrative i, I never I, d- I just don't i don't buy it mm-hmm. to be honest uh, yeah um and but on the second then the second part also goes to that generalization really um Michaela, yeah, it is Michaela Wrong who wrote that review. He's he's a fantastic um, writer of Africa books and has a, her first novel out now, um, just or out soon, I think. Um, she, yeah, she she made that point about um, there being a lack of solutions. Personally, I'd say to that, well, I I don't think I'm in a position to to, to offer a sort of set of solutions for 48 countries of sub-Sahara, um, and I think a lot of non-fiction feels obliged to come up with a solution because it's a sort of basic human instinct isn't it that we like 10 no ways to, to fix them. africa yeah 10 way <laughs> 10 10 quick and easy ways <laughs> to, to fix africa without losing your armchair that's right but, uh, uh, but yeah and, and especially people especially kind of um you know people who work in aid agencies or, or overseas aid departments or whatever you know there has to be a policy response to some of this and you know there isn't to some to some problems. Well, but you'd be I, a terrible I, marketer for the aid business because the way you're talking doesn't raise money. It, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but I think no. But I, I, I do think with this as well, and this comes back to the point about this about um, you know, this isn't a book about corruption that happens within the borders of Africa. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the um, a lot of it does. But this is a truly global system. It just so happens that the people who hold some of the political power and the resources themselves sit within Africa. <laughs> but I think with a lot of this argument about what can be done, you have to sort of especially when it's an argument that's being had in North America or, or Western Europe or wherever, um, it's an argument about putting your own house in order. I mean, every single one of these corruption schemes that I've tried to look into and map out, they all involve um, tax havens and they all involve the ease with which someone can go and set up um, a shell company, a front company in the British Virgin Islands and wherever. N- no one apart from some lawyer will ever know who the owner of that company is. Um, and, and this is the kind of plumbing of the looting machine. Um, and there are other there are other specific examples about things that could be changed about how due diligence works, how corruption legislation works. But that is a huge one. And it's starting to change. David Cameron's making some noises about pushing towards having like a proper global registry of beneficial owners of companies, and and there are things like that that that, that can be done. But I just I'm not entirely sure I'm in a I, I'm in a position to sort of to, to sort of lecture very wise and experienced well, African African lily. Although I would just say as a, as a last thought on that, I mean I do try to quote those ones who seem to be the most enlightened, and someone like Lamedo Sanusi in Nigeria is a good example. I mean he. He draws a very strong comparison between China and the old imperial powers, saying basically it's manufactured goods coming in and raw resources going out. Um, uh, and he argues for a kind of more of an industrial policy, more more sort of old school style thing of, of trying to focus above all on diversifying domestic African economies of about, you know, making cars and making textiles and what have you and capturing more of the kind of value chain, which is which seems that seems a very wise idea as well. Yeah, I, I want to take your kind of your globalized, you know, where you put the blame is on a more of a global capitalism and kind of take it one step further uh, and to put it on to you and me and everybody else that, you know, the guy sitting in the coffee shop in Brooklyn, you know, on his apple, you know, and consuming a Kenyan coffee. Um, he's part of it. We're all part of it. And, you know, that tantalum that comes out of the DRC, the hell holes in the Eastern Congo, um, you know, feed the iPhones and the Samsung Galaxy S5s. I mean, we're all part of this system that relies on the looting machine to be there. And yeah, but it's, it's not to absolve. It's, it's, it's not, not to absolve. It's to absolve Joseph Kabila or the, you know, the, the Victor Boot in the Eastern Congo or whatever. But it's to say that it's part of a system. Yeah, It's part of a system. I mean, it comes back down to, you know, people complain about, you know, I'm here in Vietnam and people talk about the labor conditions in the factories. But yet at Target or at Walmart in the United States or at Tesco in the UK, people will not pay a penny more for a shirt. Because they're Absolutely. so price conscious. And so we want both things. We want an end to the looting machine. And we also want to have our iPhones, you know, cheap. Well, and I think you can go – I completely agree with that. And it's, it's, it's one of the sort of um, – it's the kind of cognitive dissonance of globalization this is. Uh, but there's another example in the news right now here. I mean, in the, I'm in London. The, you know, th- um, 
th- th- thousands of, li- of 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 largely African migrants in in Calais trying to force their way over uh, on the on the tunnel um, under the under the English Channel to the UK. And there's you know there's a very very strong reaction in the in the right wing British politics and media of um, which is basically. Um, you know, send these swarms of people back to where they came from. What are they doing here? This isn't our problem. Um, and um, without you know, that argument has a lot of holes in it, obviously. But but the 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 one of the big holes that no one really looks at is the fact that this is the, the free mass movement of human beings was always supposed to be part of the deal, wasn't it? It was supposed to be you know, globalization, the free movement of capital, goods, ideas, and people. And we seem very happy in, in the richer parts of the world to accept the, the cheap movement of, of goods and to some extent ideas. Um, uh, and we, we very much like the fact that we can, we can travel freely over a lot of borders. Rich but, people can but, travel over borders. R- r- rich people can travel over borders. And um, th- you know that that cargoes of natural resources are tra- are traveling almost exactly the same routes as these human cargoes and yet we don't draw the we we don't um see the connection we don't see the connection between the fact that we extract great wealth from what are essentially um very poor countries in human development terms and we don't pay very much for it and when we do we are ultimately corrupting the system to do so um we don't draw the connection between that side of the globalization bargain and enormous amounts of people um taking huge risks to try to reach the west the book is the looting machine uh, warlords tycoon smugglers and the systematic theft of africa's wealth it is really a must read for anybody interested in the china africa relationship as it does in many ways complicate a lot of the kind of simplistic stereotypes that a lot of people have about the China-Africa relationship. Tom, uh, we've asked you this before. We'll ask again. If people want to stay on top of what you're you're doing at the FT and kind of your continuing research and maybe even some of the events that you're doing to promote the book, what is the best way for people to follow you? Um, Twitter and Facebook. So um, both of which are just my name, T-O-M-B-U-R-G-I-S. And Cobus, what's the best way for people to follow you, though you don't have a book tour right now? No, I don't, sadly. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm on our Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash China Africa Project, and we aggregate a daily feed of China Africa news. Um, and I'm also on Twitter at Stadenesk. That's S-T-A-D-E-N-E-S-Q-U-E. We are updating this feed 24 hours a day. It's just manic. I mean, it's completely obsessive, but it's great for everybody else because it's just a wonderful way to stay on top of a curated feed of China Africa news. I do something a little bit similar over my Twitter feed at E-O-Lander, E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. But if that's all a little too much for you and you just want a, a, an appetizer-sized bite of it, uh, we have a news newsletter that we publish out every Monday with four or five stories and a podcast and an academic article. So it's really a much smaller digestible version of it. And you can find that just go over to our website at ChinaAfricaProject.com. There's sign up buttons all over the place and you can get that email delivered straight to your inbox on every Monday. And of course, if you want to follow this podcast, iTunes is the best way. Just type in all the dots and W's, then China Africa in the search box and we will pop right on up. And if you could, I'm begging you just to leave us a rating or a review as that really helps us uh, become more discoverable for other people to, to find the podcast. So we'll be back again very soon with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening.